Madam Butterfly, I, I, I can't be absolutely sure about the figures, but I suspect it might have been the most performed opera around the world during the Second World War. Uh, it was the only place where it was dropped from the repertoire was the Metropolitan New York because they didn't want a representation of a, an American naval officer treating a Japanese girl badly. Uh, they thought that was a bit embarrassing. Uh, and it was also um, a, a dropped from the repertoire of the Marseille Opera under very particular circumstances in November 1942 after the American torch landings in North Africa that prompted the Germans to invade the south of France, they took over Marseille, and I think they were just scared of what might happen in the audience in reaction to this particular passage of the opera. Uh, these two women, uh, were, uh, their fates were linked by uh, the, uh, Madame Butterfly. Uh, on the left is Fania Fenelon, uh, who wrote Playing for Time. She was in the Auschwitz Orchestra. And her life was saved. She was on the way to the gas chambers. And it's, I don't know how this came out, but it, she, she was trained as a classical singer. She knew Madame Butterfly off by heart. And on the right is the notorious Maria Mandel, probably the most evil woman psychopathic criminal in history, responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. But she had a particular weakness for Madame Butterfly. And uh, she, uh, when she heard that, that she, I think there was an announcement, does anybody know Madame Butterfly? And, Marie, and uh, Fania Fenelon said yes. Uh, and she was able to write out the notes. And she was able to perform two pieces from it, uh, one fine day and the flower duet. And in her book, she tells this extremely macabre story I mean, you're looking in this face, it's a bit like Mara Hindley, you're looking into the face of evil. But this woman uh, fantasized about Madame Butterfly. And at one point, uh, she saved a, a cute, curly-headed, blonde boy from the gas chambers to play with him and to fantasize about being Madame Butterfly in the last act of Madame Butterfly with this uh, sweet child. She played with this child for a few days before then once again sending it off to the gas chambers. Uh, so uh, Madame Butterfly elsewhere, this is Marit Cevatari, who a uh, beautiful Romanian soprano who must have looked gorgeous in the role as well as sounding very good. She was the most popular Madame Butterfly in the German speaking world. And the most popular Madame Butterfly here who sang it all the way through the war endlessly was the American, oh, sorry, Australian soprano Joan Hammond. She can never have looked very convincing. She was, uh, in Australia, she was a, a champion golfer and she had the physique and the shoulders of a champion golfer. And there's a wonderful story of her singing Madame Butterfly in Glasgow and having to catch the last train back to London for a concert the next day. So not having the time to change and startling uh, people at, at Glasgow Central Station by uh, sprinting across the station concourse, dressed in full gear as Madame Butterfly in her kimono uh, outfit. And uh, so uh, my next uh, uh, little excerpt is to show you how uh, people use this kind of music, in often in very, very personal ways. This is actually a story from my family. This is my mother on the right-hand side in her Wren's uniform. And uh, she, was, uh, she was on a troop ship to Palestine in 1944, and she met a young soldier who fell in love with her and rather sweetly declared his love by giving her this record. Uh, you, can, you can see it's got, it's, perhaps you can read it, it says, with love from Bill, across the title of this section of the love duet, which is, Ah, Love Me a Little. Uh, now, my third lady is Lily Marlene, uh, and she is really it, oh, yes, I see. One minute to go. Uh, perhaps I won't get into it. She's a toughie. She can take care of herself. And it's a very famous story. So I think you can find out that one for yourself. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, right. Uh, well, uh, so, uh, well, the, the, if you, the, our song of the Second World War in this country is We'll Meet Again, Vera Lynn. Uh, for a German, it would be uh, Zara Leander singing Ich weiß es wird einmal ein Wunder geschehen. But for everybody, it is actually Lily Marlene. And this is a most extraordinary story. 
Uh, uh, the song was written by this composer, Norbert Schulze. If anybody can read German, I hugely recommend his autobiography. It's a very entertaining, fascinating book from a man who was an absolute tool of the, of the Nazis. And a, a total, I mean, you can't dislike him. Somehow he's so shameless in his book uh, and so honest that you land up liking him somehow. And he came across these poems by a, a poet called Hans Leip, written during the First World War. And he wrote this uh, song actually on a commission. Uh, uh, and it's the story of a, a prostitute outside um, a barracks and uh, uh, waiting for her lover under the lamp. And uh, it was recorded in 1939, just before the outbreak of war, by Lala Anderson. She was a little known singer. This is the record. It sold a few hundred copies. It disappeared without trace and would never have reappeared if it were not for a whole series of accidents. Uh, the Germans arrived in uh, Belgrade. They took over Belgrade and they wanted to use Radio Belgrade to broadcast to the whole Mediterranean war theater. Uh, they looked in the archives. They found that most of the music was either by Slav composers or Jewish composers, so that all got chucked out. There was almost nothing left. So they, they, went, uh, to, they sent somebody to Vienna and uh, Vienna were, were a bit sniffy, but they said, well, you can have our cast off. And we don't want to play this particular record because it starts with a, a bugle call, uh, which is the Prussian bugle call. So, uh, 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 and in Vienna, they had a different one. And uh, you know, there's a big hostility between North Germans and South Germans and so on. So they didn't want to play it. So that was sent in amongst a small group of records. It was played over the radio. And uh, uh, it, the German troops loved it. And uh, th this is uh, from a propaganda film made by the British about this song during the war. Here it is being broadcast in Belgrade. Here are troops uh, on, in, in the North African uh, desert listening to it. Uh, and there are stories about how there would be a little ceasefire when it was played every night at 10 o'clock to end the broadcast, that people would stop killing each other. Uh, uh, Alberto, I think you, that's something to uh, think about. Uh, that for five minutes, everybody put down their, their guns and they listened to this song. And uh, it was picked up by the British. And uh, there is, uh, let me recommend to you a wonderful publication by the German publishers, the Bear family, on 10 CDs, 277 different versions of Lily Marlene uh, in Estonian, Lithuanian. Uh, it just became this incredible phenomenon. And I know I really have to stop. Can, can I just play you a little bit of the original record? <laughs> 